Hello everyone, this is Professor Casey. Today we're finally getting to discussing the seminal event in American history, especially during the 19th century, and that is the American Civil War, okay, sometimes referred to here as the War of the Union. All right? um, this is a very long and complex struggle uh, that we've essentially been building up to uh, since the country really was founded. Okay, We've already had several um, core principles that each side of the country, north and south, have already begun to embody from the very beginning, um, and it seems like we have been on a collision course ever since, okay, and the, uh, the, the tempers have only flared more and more since the, since the country was founded. Uh, we've seen plenty of sectionalist differences that might have been resolved otherwise, but the nation has never truly been completely unified up until this point, okay? So um, looking at the uh, Civil War here, we're going to break this up into two sections. The first part here, we're discussing the first half of the war, and in the second half, of course, we're discussing the second half. So at the very beginning of this conflict here, we have to actually um, stop and take a look at the two different sides here and what it is they bring to the table to really get a feel for exactly how this is going to go. Okay. Now, when it comes to the Confederacy here, they actually end up holding 11 states throughout the duration of the conflict. Okay, All of the red states that you see here uh, remain part of the Confederacy from the very beginning. Right, They secede from the Union before Fort Sumter is fired upon. Okay. And the pink states that you see above them end up seceding after Fort Sumner is fired upon them. Okay, so the conflict, after it begins, we have these four states here above the red ones. Now, the blue states here are states that have traditionally had slavery as an institution, right? These are the border states that we've discussed in the past, but they never actually secede from the Union. Instead, they choose to overturn slavery, okay, and end up remaining a part of the Union. And the population of the Confederacy at this point is estimated to be about 9 million people, okay? Uh, three and a half million of which are slaves. And also the Confederacy has very specific terms about who it believes its citizens are, okay? So it uh, specifically states that white males are the citizens of the Confederacy, okay? Women are not counted as citizens, okay? They don't have the right to vote like men do. And African Americans, free or otherwise, are not considered members of the Confederacy either. And 80% of its military age white men end up fighting in the conflict at some point. Okay? Um, both sides do eventually institute a military draft. Okay? Uh, at some point it does it out of desperation if nothing else. And it's estimated that about one third of those who do end up fighting end up dying in the process. And the South is already at a major disadvantage when it comes to um, the manufacturing aspect. Okay? When it comes to supplying itself, when it comes to um, the, the arms, when it comes to uh, military uniforms, when it comes to any of the official designated products that need to be made in order for a war to be successfully fought, the South is at a major disadvantage. Okay? And it seems like it's a self-imposed disadvantage okay? because the South has chosen to deny industry for the most part. Okay? Um, it has uh, complained several times, of course, that the railroad has not uh, come down into the South very much. But um, in, in cases like this, though, it has, uh, again, it has denied the presence of factories. It has constantly complained that the North is trying to infringe upon the agrarian lifestyle of the South. Okay? So the South only produces about 7% of the nation's manufactured goods. It does pro produce a lot of the agriculture, but most of that is not even stuff that can be eaten. Okay, it's cotton, it's tobacco, it's non-consumable cash crops. Okay, so thinking that it can outlast the North by the food that it can grow is actually very unreasonable. It also has no navy to speak of. Okay? The, the Union has a standing navy that's really only used as a, um, as a port defense. Okay? It's used to defend the actual um, borders of the country right, against foreign invaders. Right? It's a defensive navy, but it's not really an offensive one. And the thing that the South does have working to its advantage is that most of the individuals who are members of the military at this point are career military men. Okay? They have been working uh, in some military capacity for um, a lifetime. Okay? So most of them are middle-aged or slightly older. Um, and the South also has a large territorial advantage because most of the battles are fought in the South. 
Okay, um, and the South has a completely different geography, a completely different climate um, that is treacherous to individuals who are not accustomed to it. Okay, so for the Union soldiers who do end up coming to the South for the first time, they encounter a place that's extremely hot, extremely humid. Uh, it's riddled with um, with swamps and bogs, quicksand, uh, deserts in some parts, right? Very heavily forested areas. And of course, the Confederacy is already used to this, right? These are men who have grown up in this place, they've hunted here, uh, and they're accustomed to, you know, every tree, every rock, and, and so forth. But it doesn't necessarily mean that each one of the states that is involved in the Confederacy is 100% loyal, okay? Eastern Tennessee, for example, ends up producing more Union soldiers than it does Confederate soldiers, okay? And it's already on a border state with Kentucky, which ends up staying as part of the Union. And one state in particular is even created out of Union loyalty, okay? After Virginia secedes from the Union in April of 1861, um, there are 39 counties in the northwestern portion of the, the state that end up deciding they're going to stay loyal to the Union, and they end up separating off in October, okay? And they form West Virginia. Now, the Union, meanwhile, holds just a little over, ha over twice what the Confederacy does in terms of states. Okay? It has 23 states, including the four border states that end up reverting back from, con from the Confederate side, you know, remaining part of the Union. Okay? They end up overturning slavery. And the population of the Union is 22 million people with 400,000 slaves. Okay? And remember, these four slave states here, five slave states after West Virginia, uh, ends up seceding here, or remaining part of the Union, breaking away from Virginia. Um, these states end up overturning slavery in time. Okay? And the Union states produce 97% of the nation's firearms and 96% of its railroad equipment. So it's extremely well equipped, well industrialized, and has a distinct manufacturing advantage over the South. It also has 90 warships to its name, okay? Um, and these warships are instrumental in securing the Mississippi River in particular, and eventually blockading the Confederacy when it comes to attempting to get aid from Europe, okay? That's one of the things the Confederacy seeks to do over time, and typically gets overlooked in this. And the U.S. Army, which is under the Union, okay, it's the Union Army here, has 16,400 men with 1,000 officers. Okay. 25% of them, though, end up resigning to join the Confederacy, one of whom is Robert E. Lee. Okay. And most of the time, the men who choose to do this do this out of some sense of uh, fealty to the South. Right? They believe that they are going to end up dishonoring themselves or their families, some sense of personal honor if they choose to remain with the Union. Remember, there's a very um, prickly sense of honor that's associated with the South, okay, whether it has to do with masculinity or family honor or something like that, right? It's an extremely strange embedded feature of, of the Confederacy at this point. And 100,000 men who live in the South end up fighting against the Confederacy, okay? So again, just because we are, you know, fairly clearly divided along North and South lines here doesn't mean there's not individuals on each side who choose to fight on behalf of the opposing side, okay? So people living in the South fight against the Confederacy in some cases, and not everybody in the North is happy with what the Union does either. Now, one of the first strategies that's um, presented here uh, involves the Union General Winfield Scott, okay? And he devises what he refers to as a three-pronged anaconda plan. Okay. And the whole idea here is, of course, to perform the exact action that an anaconda does with its prey, and that is to strangle it, okay. to basically surround the Confederacy as much as it can, right? separate it off into two distinct sections here, and basically starve it to death. The Army of the Potomac is the first Union group that we'll discuss here. Okay. Uh, this is the main Union army that's uh, uh, used to defend Washington, D.C., okay? It's located in, uh, in and around Virginia, right? This is the area that a lot of the northern battles are fought, okay? And the Army of the Potomac is constantly dispatched time and time again, okay? Probably about uh, between six and 12 times over the course of the war in the immediate vicinity. 
and their main goal is not only to defend Washington, D.C., but to constantly exert pressure on the Confederate capital, which is very close to the Union capital, right, right nearby at Richmond, okay? So Washington, D.C. and Richmond are probably only about uh, 100 miles or less apart at this point. And the Federal Navy is used, again, to blockade the Confederate ports, right, to try to prevent access to food and weapons being sent to and from them. And, of course, their other plan here is to divide the Confederate forces along the major waterways, specifically the Mississippi River, which you see right here in the center of the map, okay? If it can divide the Confederacy uh, specifically along the Mississippi, right, then Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana are essentially going to be starved out, right? All of the um, all of the goods that come from the deep south that are being sent into these areas where any fighting might be occurring um, end up drying up. Okay, so these three states are going to be basically rendered helpless. Is the is the goal here? And the whole idea behind the Confederacy here, what they decide to do for their strategy is to prolong the wars long as they possibly can. Okay, this is Jefferson Davis's goal. Remember, Dave, Davis at this point is made uh, the president of the Confederacy. And he hopes at some point that England and France are going to intervene on behalf of them, okay, because the South, remember, has had a pretty long-standing commercial relationship with Europe. Okay, it has sent uh, cotton in particular, right, overseas, and 80% of the cotton produced in the South is being uh, used by England at this point, okay? So it thinks that because it has been exporting so many goods that eventually these countries will see the need to intervene. And France does uh, agree to intervene, but conditionally here, only if England decides to do so, okay? And when it's left up to England, the British decide that they are going to seek commerce elsewhere. They're not going to get involved in America's internal affairs, okay? So they end up going with India instead, okay? And choose India as their uh, their permanent, um, or semi-permanent anyway, um, source of cotton throughout the duration of this, okay? And choose not to recognize the Confederacy here, okay? So Europe has agreed to completely stay out of this, okay? So again, already this is another disadvantage for the Confederacy. And Davis also thinks that the war is eventually going to um, cause the Northerners to look at this as something unjust and that Abraham Lincoln is going to end up getting a lot of bad press from this. Now, again, the Union and the Confederacy have very different goals here in terms of what they want to see happen at the end of all this. Confederacy wants to convince the Union and the world that it is independent, okay, that it is uh, it's trying to basically repeat what has been done during the American Revolution. It believes it's justified in uh, having a very different worldview, a very different um, uh, commercial ideology, and especially where slavery is concerned. Okay? And the Union wants to simply restore the Union, right? wants to bring the South back into the fold and pick up where we left off. Now, once Fort Sumter falls to the Confederacy, remember, this is where... Uh, you know, Union forces have tried to intervene already. Uh, they've received calls for aid. The Union forces have tried to intervene. They've shown up in ships, and the Confederacy has fired cannons on them. Okay, so Fort Sumner has already fallen by this point. And neither side is really prepared for a major war. Okay, the South has kind of put its foot in the mix here by doing this. Now, in summer of 1861, Jefferson Davis tells his one of his generals, Pierre Beauregard here, to rush the area called Manassas Junction in Northern Virginia. Okay. Now the specific location, and quick parenthetical note here about battles during the Civil War. Um, battles typically get confused quite a bit because the North and the South each comes up with different names for the same battle. Okay. Each side comes up with its own name for the battle because the North begins to look at natural features, okay? So it names its battles after major rivers, major geographical locations, and the South typically names it after man-made structures nearby, okay? So the South calls this battle the Battle for Manassas Junction after the railroad junctions nearby, and the North refers to this as the Battle of Bull Run, okay? Bull Run is the name of uh, a local creek or riverbed okay, that's nearby. So again, this gets a little bit confusing. I try to simplify it as much as I can here. 
So Lincoln sends Union soldiers here against the Confederates, believing that he is going to be able to attack, uh, or that uh, the Confederates are going to end up attacking Richmond, Virginia, and that Lincoln is going to be able to intervene and stop this quickly. And the most infuriating thing about the Civil War and about other major battles going from this point forward, and even in some cases when we get to um, parts of the 20th century, people don't seem to understand how incredibly deadly and destructive war actually is. Okay, um, The civilians living in the general vicinity of Bull Run slash Manassas Junction actually pack picnic lunches and go out and sit near the battlefield to watch this happen. Okay, They think that this is going to be um, some kind of like a wrestling match or something, and that people are going to end the war in a single afternoon and we're all going to go home happy. Okay, It's an extremely naive um, situation here. What actually happens, though, is a bloodbath. Okay, We have 37,000 Union soldiers um, that fight the Confederates here at Bull Run, okay? and Bull Run is a, a branch of the Potomac River. Okay? Stonewall Jackson rallies the Confederate troops in the midst of all this, okay? and the Confederates end up winning the battle, okay? and many of the civilians who come out to watch this are caught in the crossfire. Okay? So you actually have uh, innocent people getting shot and killed, okay? um, and I believe your textbook even evokes the image of them with, um, with you know, pie filling still in their mouths, with, uh, with uh, empty food plates being scattered everywhere, picnic blankets torn to shreds, and all this kind of stuff. It's a very uh, grisly scene. The Union soldiers do end up sounding a retreat, and one of the other major features of the Civil War that is another somewhat infuriating thing is that any time one side sounds a retreat, the other side refuses to give chase. Okay, and this ends up getting a lot of officers in a lot of trouble over time, okay? um, because if one side retreats, the other side is supposed to give chase until the other side is completely defeated. Okay? But for some reason, there's some kind of invisible boundary that prevents one side or another from giving chase. And when Bull Run is lost, right, Lincoln immediately is uh, criticized for this, right, that the Union Army is not equipped for this, that they're not prepared for the, the level of uh, tenacity that the Confederacy is going to end up showing. And both sides have a lot of miscalculation, okay? The soldiers are very inexperienced, okay? They didn't expect war to be so bloody, so deadly, so chaotic, okay? Um, and again, not uh, there's there's very little conviction on both sides. Okay, um, they they have you know this romantic idea of what they believe war is, but when the reality sets in, right, it becomes a very different thing. Now, after the Battle of Bull Run is lost, Lincoln calls for the Union Army to be inflated significantly. Okay? He wants half a million more men. And Ulysses S. Grant, who is a Mexican-American war veteran, ends up rejoining the army here as a direct result. And eventually Grant becomes the, confet the um, uh, full general over Union forces. And the 19th century U.S. Army soldier looks something like this. Okay? Um, wears this kind of blue uniform with the typical you know, uh, flat-topped hat, uh, an army pack, right, and whatever supplies he can carry on his back, along with a rifle. Okay. Um, and the 19th century U.S. Army is made up of uh, several regiments, okay? and each regiment has a thousand soldiers. One-fourth of all the Union soldiers are actually foreign-born, okay? so you have a large contingency of immigrants fighting in this particular battle. And they're attracted to service for a number of reasons here. Okay? Sometimes it's simply belief in the Union cause, sometimes it's cash bonuses, right? they're there they're just for the money. And sometimes it's just for regular pay. Okay, other jobs at this point are, uh, you know, potentially less stable. Right, working in a factory, you could easily lose uh, life and limb. Of course, going off to fight in a war is no different. But here, you are actually engaged as long as the war goes on. Okay, so you're not going to get laid off. In other words, so again, regular pay and steady jobs both kind of go hand in hand. And many Northerners are actually uh, able to avoid military service in several different ways. Okay? Um, if you hold a federal or state government office, okay, you're able to avoid service because you're needed elsewhere. 
You can gain medical or compassionate exemptions, right? If you uh, if you're the, the sole provider for your family, uh, if you have um, you know people in your family who are invalids who cannot take care of themselves, who cannot gain any kind of government subsidy, or you could pay your way out. Okay, if you pay a three hundred dollar fine to the government, then it means that someone else can serve in your stead. And the Confederate regiments are very, very homogenous. Okay, there is no real diversity. Okay, these are individuals who have been born and raised in the South. Um, they, uh, there are very few immigrants who uh, end up serving. In fact, um, a very small percentage. Okay, by comparison. Um, and again, they're all white males. Okay, there, there are no African American soldiers until the very, very end of the Civil War. Okay, in terms of the Confederate side, that is. And again, there's a very small male population in the South. Okay, um, this ends up leading to a very large military draft that ends up being um, exercised over time. So, on April 16th of 1862, Jefferson Davis requires that all white males between the ages of 18 and 35 have to serve in the army for a period of three years. And there's a lot of loopholes that go into this. Okay, again, draftees are able to pay substitu substitutes to serve in their stead. Okay, not too dissimilar to what the North does. They have to pay the government $500 not to serve, though, okay? because the South tends to be a little bit more um, uh, wealthy than the North does in terms of the the percentage of individuals who have wealth. Okay. Um, and also the fact that the South has very limited uh, funding, okay, has very limited uh, monetary reserves, okay, that becomes another major issue over time. And again, the same type of thing, if you're an elected official, a key civilian worker, or if you are extremely wealthy, if you're a planter who has more than 20 slaves, okay, then you're exempted from service. But the draft is not put into full effect until 1863, and it becomes very easy for people to dodge the draft, okay? Because all you have to do is disappear into the wilderness in the South, okay? And it's not like someone is going to come looking for you for very long. Now, in the Western portion of all this, we also have a significant amount of fighting that occurs, okay? Um, and this is typically west of the Mississippi River along the Kansas and Missouri border. Now, one individual named William Quantrill becomes the most prominent pro-Confederate leaders during this period, and he fights under a black flag. In other words, he takes no prisoners. He kills all individuals attempting to surrender to him. In 1863, he goes into Lawrence, Kansas, and kills 182 of the males in the town. Okay, um, And those who are members of pro-Union uh, contingencies in Kansas are known as Jayhawkers, and they end up coming after him in time. Okay, so Jayhawkers are where we get, um, I believe it's Kansas State University's mascot. And also we get the uh, cooperation in some cases of Native Americans, okay, specifically those living in the Oklahoma Territory, okay. And remember, the Oklahoma Territory is where most of the Native American tribes who used to live uh, east of the Mississippi River have landed after the Jeffersonian period, okay, or the Jacksonian period, I beg your pardon. So again, these are uh, groups that have had to pack up and leave because of the uh, Indian Relocation Act. And so we get a group of quote unquote five civilized tribes, okay, who actually end up holding slaves and they feel some strange amount of kinship with Southern whites, okay, for whatever reason, okay. Um, and these include the Choctaws and the Chickasaws who openly support the Confederacy. And we also get the Cherokee, the Creek, and the Seminole who have already had roles to play in the past with American conflicts. Um, and they're a little bit more divided here. The Cherokees are actually divided into two separate factions. Okay, we've had the Eastern Contingency and those who have had to pack up and leave along the Trail of Tears. Now, in 1862, Grant decides he's going to move the Confe against the Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnson in Kentucky. Okay, Grant is still located uh, in and around Washington, D.C. at this point, and he decides he is going to take the army into Kentucky. Grant manages to capture Fort Henry in northern Tennessee in February. And 10 days later, on February 16th, 12,000 Confederates end up surrendering Fort Donelson. Okay, So these two areas that you see down here at the, um, the bottom left portion of the map 
are, are both uh, major victories for the Union at this point. Okay, So even though the Union has already lost the first battle to the Confederate side, it's suddenly beginning to win battles again. So uh, the battle for Fort Donelson and the capture of the fort ends up being the first major Union victory that's actually celebrated in the North. Okay, This is a turn of fortunes. But in the meantime, it's a, it's a very short-lived celebration because Lincoln's 11-year-old son, Willie, ends up succumbing to typhoid fever. Okay? Uh, and Lincoln is left in a, a very prolonged state of grief from this point going forward. Um, and it's worth noting, too, that Lincoln is a very melancholy individual. Okay? He uh, uh, allegedly su uh, suffered from uh, major depression, clinical depression, for, for most of his life. Um, and one um, parenthetical story is that he allegedly refused to carry a pocket knife because he was concerned that he would engage in self-harm. Okay? So, you know, whether you believe it or not, Lincoln does appear to have been a very complex figure, at least on the inside. Now, again, we go into a period here where we have Confederate forces who are retreating, okay, away from Fort Henry and Fort Donelson, which you still see here kind of in the uh, the left center of the map here. And the goal for the Confederacy here is to protect the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. Okay, this is what links the lower Mississippi Valley and the Atlantic coast together. And Grant decides that he is going to uh, actually, uh, rather than refuse to give chase, he's going to give chase a little too much. Okay, and he ends up actually exposing his troops to the Confederacy a little too early on. So on April 6th, Albert Sidney Johnson launches a surprise attack at dawn on Grant's camp at Shiloh, Tennessee. Okay, and Shiloh is what you see here in the, the lower part of Tennessee, okay, a little bit where all the arrows are pointing on the map. Johnson, though, is actually killed in the attack, okay, very uh, unfortunately for him. And the Union soldiers are suddenly driven into retreat. The following day, on April 7th, Union troops end up rallying. They get 25,000 reinforcements who arrive at dawn, and now the Confederacy is sent into retreat. Okay? So this is another feature, again, of this uh, idea of the Union and the Confederacy constantly going back and forth into retreat. Okay? Uh, and it's something that ends up producing kind of this yo-yo effect. Okay? So it's a little bit, uh, little bit irritating you know, going into all the details of the different battles when this is kind of the constant back and forth, uh, this elasticity, so to speak, of the war. In this particular battle, though, one-fourth of 100,000 participants are either killed or wounded, so upwards of 25,000 men. And another Union general named Henry Halleck begins to spread false rumors about Grant here, that Grant had been drinking constantly during the battle um, because he had a grudge against Grant, right? Grant actually was given a little bit of favor uh, in the Confederate, or in the Union Army, because remember, he was a, a war veteran from the Mexican-American War, and Henry Halleck simply wanted Grant's job, is what it amounts to. Uh, so Halleck starts to petition Lincoln to fire Grant, um, and Lincoln refuses to do so, but ends up giving Halleck a field command in the process. Now, a little bit further south here, three weeks after the Battle of Shiloh happens, Union warships under David Farragut, who you see here, arrive in the Gulf of Mexico and take control of New Orleans. Okay, they end up uh, basically trying to sandwich um, the Confederacy using the second branch of this Anaconda plan that we've already discussed. So they set up a naval blockade of New Orleans and prevent any commerce from going in and out of the city. And the Union general named Benjamin Butler is made the military governor of the city. Yeah. Union gains control of 1,500 cotton plantations in the meantime, right, in and around New Orleans, and liberates about 50,000 slaves living in the Mississippi Valley. Okay? And slavery is effectively destroyed in Louisiana in one fell swoop. Okay? So this is a very big uh, victory for the Union at this point, okay? because, again, able to you know, sandwich the Confederacy in this manner and to gain control not only of New Orleans, but a significant portion of the Mississippi River Valley. Uh, again, this is what um, brings the cotton industry to a grinding halt. Now, in the summer of 1862, we have two Confederate generals, Braxton Bragg and Edmund Kirby Smith, okay? And these two men end up controlling um, two different uh, Confederate contingencies here, who end up linking together to take control of Kentucky. Okay, So Braxton Bragg controls the Mississippi Army, and Edmund Kirby Smith 
has control of the Eastern Tennessee Army. In October, the Confederates meet up with the Union General, Don Carlos Buell, in Perryville, Kentucky. Okay. And the Confederacy is outnumbered here. Okay. They end up attacking the Union line, but they end up retreating. Okay. And Kentucky is actually left in the Union hands for the remainder of the war. Okay. So Kentucky is no longer uh, a, a major source of fighting any longer. Okay. So every area north of Tennessee is effectively in Union control from this point going forward. Now in the east, following the Battle of Bull Run, Lincoln decides he's going to appoint um, General George B. McClellan to lead the Army of the Potomac. Okay, and the Army of the Potomac, remember, is the army that is given the specific uh, task of defending the capital, Washington, D.C. And even though McClellan is organized and is a very confident individual, he is extremely overcautious to the point of being uh, crippled by this, and it ends up uh, costing him his position in time. In March of 1862, McClellan takes a 122,000 man army down the Potomac River, okay, which you see here. This is what uh, divides the, uh, the green and the yellow sections, okay, this little squiggly line, that's the Potomac River, okay. Leads them down the Potomac, and he stops 60 miles from Richmond, Virginia, believing that the Confederate defenses are extremely heavy, okay, when in reality they're really not. Okay. If he had continued all the way down, he might have been able to capture Richmond, Virginia, okay, the Confederate capital, and this might have turned the tide of the war very, very quickly. On May 31st, okay, the Confederate General Joseph Johnston ends up attacking McClellan, okay, six miles east of Richmond. Okay, so McClellan has essentially stopped and has uh, not gone any further. Okay, he hasn't uh, because he hasn't advanced. He's left himself open for attack. And the battle that's known as the Battle of Seven Pines, okay, this is the, again, this is the um, Union name for this battle, okay, results in a very close Union victory just simply because of reinforcements, okay. If reinforcements hadn't shown up, it would have been McClellan's fault that, uh, that the Union might have lost, okay. But, again, the Union does manage to win this. And Robert E. Lee ends up taking control of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, okay. So now we effectively have um, Ulysses S. Grant on one side and Robert E. Lee on the other side. On July 9th, Lincoln decides to pay McClellan a visit at his headquarters on the Virginia coast. Okay. And this is a, a very seminal visit because there are actually photographs of Lincoln meeting in, his, in McClellan's tent with McClellan. And the two of them get into a major argument over McClellan's choice of strategy here. Because McClellan complains that Lincoln uh, didn't support him enough, okay, that he waited until the last minute to send reinforcements, and starts to try to actually lecture Lincoln on military strategy. And in response, Lincoln says that McClellan doesn't deserve his position, okay, relieves him of command, and puts Henry Halleck in charge. Okay, remember, Halleck was the one who started spreading rumors about Grant drinking. And so Lincoln and Halleck order McClellan to go back to Washington and join up with General John Pope, who is the commander of the Union Army of Virginia. Meanwhile, Robert E. Lee launches a preemptive strike against Pope before McClellan can even arrive in Virginia, in Richmond, that is. On August 30th, Lee ends up dividing his forces, sends Stonewall Jackson to flank Pope. And the Second Battle of Bull Run results in another Confederate victory. So Bull Run is constantly uh, a source of victory for the Confederacy in the midst of all this. They've won two battles at that location so far. So here is this photograph that you see in the background. It's a bit washed out, but it can be found out on the internet. On the left, you see Abraham Lincoln silently listening to McClellan, who's sitting on the right, uh, getting into... Uh, discussing military strategy. Okay, so this is a very rare on the ground photograph that you see of a major conflict uh, and a major event within that conflict. Okay, and Lincoln, uh, this is one of the only uh, action photographs that you see of him that's not staged. So in summer of 1862, Robert E. Lee plans to invade Maryland this time, okay, forcing McClellan to leave Northern Virginia altogether. Okay. And again, this is where he tries to get the British and the French to recognize the Confederacy, but to no avail, ultimately. 
and he wants to gain control of Maryland and cause it to secede from the Union. Remember, Maryland is one of these border states that still has slavery as an institution, but over time ends up remaining part of the Confederate, remaining part of the Union, that is, and getting rid of slavery altogether. So on September 17th, Lee's forces, which are extremely malnourished by this point, they've marched quite a long time up north, uh, end up clashing with the Union forces at the Battle of Antietam, okay? And this is near Sharpsburg, Maryland. Okay, so the South calls this the Battle of Sharpsburg, and the North calls this the Battle of Antietam. And Union soldiers end up discovering that Lee's battle plans uh, have been wrapped around three cigars that were carried by a Confederate soldier who carelessly dropped them on the battlefield. Okay, so the Union has suddenly had this amazing stroke of luck where it finds these battle plans, handwritten ones, and suddenly has a direct line into the mind of Robert E. Lee. And they launch several attacks over the course of 14 hours against the Confederacy. And Lee's forces are only able to escape once the sun sets. Okay, they retreat back into Virginia. And the battle is ultimately considered a draw here, even though Lee's ultimate goal in fighting this particular battle fails. And of course, McClellan refuses to give chase once again, okay? And Lincoln is absolutely livid with him by this point, okay? He has failed time and time again to, uh, to use any kind of thoughtful strategy here. And McClellan is finally fired uh, overall from any of his major commands. He is demoted and sent to perform recruitment duty in New Jersey, okay? So McClellan is very, very quickly put out of commission here. And the outcome of the Battle of Antietam is uh, produced some of the most harrowing photographs from the Civil War. Okay? Uh, one of the more famous ones is the one you see here. Um, it, I apologize for the, the gruesome nature of this. I, I specifically made it small so you couldn't see any of the carnage. But you see a few men here who are lying dead on the ground. Uh, and the, it's difficult to see until you actually find a larger photograph of this, but there are uh, pockmarks all in the ground from cannon fire, and even in the house in the background, if you get in close enough, you can see holes that have been punched directly through the walls from cannon fire and from rifle fire. And there are still houses in this particular vicinity, if I'm not mistaken, um, that still hold the wounds from the Civil War, okay? houses that have been preserved as historical sites that still have bullet holes in the walls, some of which still have cannonball holes in the walls. And the outcome of the Battle of Antietam has a few very important results here, okay? one which uh, revives the morale of Northerners, okay? because the Northerners were starting to get tired of this war very quickly. It also ends the Confederacy's hopes of getting uh, um, support from Europe, because remember, Great Britain and France have already decided that they are not willing to get involved in U.S. internal affairs. And it also becomes a major political turning point for Abraham Lincoln, because up until this point, he has not been willing to take an abolitionist stance here. But because of the several victories that the Union has managed to accrue here, and because of the growing um, lack of support that the Confederacy has, right? The, the dwindling support that it has, okay? the, the disadvantages that the Confederacy has. Lincoln decides that he is going to turn this into a political stance and use the rest of the war as a crusade to end slavery altogether. Okay, so this is the point where Lincoln becomes an abolitionist, and he does it really more for political points than anything else. Okay, it's not to say he's a bad person for, for waiting so long to do this, right? He, remember, was attempting to keep the Union stable for a very long period of time, but from a moralist stance, right, this is where he really turns the corner. And he begins by issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. Okay, this is what occurs in September of 1862, five days after the Battle of Antietam. And he warns the Confederacy that if fighting does not cease, right, he uses this as a bargaining chip. Okay? He says all slaves are going to be made forever free, quote unquote, on January 1st of 1863. Okay? He's using this as an executive order to, uh, to free the slaves. Okay? And remember, this is what the Confederacy has feared the most. They have worried from his very first day in office that he would eventually do this, okay? And this is what the Confederacy has feared at its core, right? That all slaves are suddenly gonna be made free and that they are gonna potentially be armed and come after the slave owners. 
And again, this is used, utilized as a form of military necessity rather than morality. Okay? Um, Lincoln later calls this an act of justice, and people have criticized Lincoln constantly for not doing this sooner. Okay? And it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's difficult not to see both sides of this in some regards, because again, in attempting to keep the Union in place once he's elected, right, the Confederacy is already starting to ramp itself up and make itself a separate uh, entity from the first day he is in office, okay? So he's, he's fighting a losing battle by trying to keep them together already, and it seems like it might have been more expedient for him to go all the way, so to speak, and issue this proclamation from the get-go. But again, hindsight is 2020. And of course, the Democratic Party at this point is extremely enraged by him doing this. They believe that this is, uh, that he's overstepping his bounds, that this is too dictatorial, again, that he is infringing on the way of life of some people, that he is somehow depriving them of the rights to property. Remember, people are still using that as an excuse, and that this is unconstitutional. And the only reason, again, that it is unconstitutional is because, um, you know, the Founding Fathers didn't include this in the first place. So, November of 1862, the Republicans end up losing several seats to the Democrats because of opposition to the Emancipation Proclamation. Again, this is extremely unpopular with the Democrats. Okay, the Republicans believe that they are justified in allowing this to continue, and the Republicans become more and more radicalized over time, especially in the Senate. Okay, this is uh, the group that is known as the Radical Republicans, okay, which you'll hear more about once you get into Chapter 16. Democrats call this unconstitutional, dictatorial, as we've already said, uh, and suddenly news spreads like wildfire among the slave states that this is about to occur, okay? And uh, hundreds of thousands of slaves use this as a red flag and say goodbye, <laughs> okay? They pack up and leave in the dead of night uh, and try to escape into the north. Um, and this further causes the Confederacy to stay, um, to stay out of the, the auspices of Europe. Okay, Europe looks at this and says, we've already gotten rid of slavery. Um, if the Confederacy is going to double down on this, then we want no part in this. Okay, if anything, we're going to support the Union and only from a distance. We're not going to send supplies or anything like that, but it seems like the Union has the right way of it. And so all of a sudden, the Union turns everything on its head and it has more moral legitimacy in fighting this war. And now the Union Army is suddenly viewed not just as a, an army that's trying to preserve the Union, now it is viewed by slaves living in the South as a liberating force. And the final battle we'll talk about for the first half here is the Battle of Fredericksburg. Okay? Fall of 1862, Lincoln chooses Ambrose Burnside as the new commanding general. Now, quick note about him, just as a fun little parenthetical fact, Ambrose Burnside is the man for whom we get the term sideburns, for very obvious reasons. <laughs> okay. um, December 13th, Burnside sends a 122,000-man Potomac Army, again, west into Fredericksburg, Virginia. Okay. He's made the commanding army, or the commanding general of the Potomac forces. Confederate cannons end up decimating the Union forces, though, when they cross a half-mile open field. Okay. The Confederates are laying in... Uh, and wait for them, right? They've set a trap. 12,600 Union soldiers are killed, and only 5,300 Confederates are killed, fewer than that. And the worst part of all this is Burnside ends up retreating and leaves thousands of wounded men on the battlefield to die. Okay, so this is a very, um, you know, very cowardly act in the eyes of both sides, really. And the end of the year, uh, results with a stalemate in the East, okay, and Union expansion in the West slows down quite a bit, okay, so um, for a very long period of time from this, port, this point going forward, um, the Union is not really able to gain a whole lot of ground, okay, and it's not until we get into the latter years of the war that things start to gain traction again. And all of a sudden, the Northerners' morale suddenly starts to plummet once again, okay, um, the Democratic victory in Congress suddenly puts Lincoln on the defensive. Okay? Suddenly, all these seats are uh, opening and going back to the Democrats. Okay? And it seems like the, uh, the Democratic Party uh, might end up gaining the upper hand politically, and he may be second, you know, giving second thoughts to, to the Emancipation Proclamation. Right? He doesn't realize how much of a, uh, a pushback he was going to get with this. 
and now a lot of northerners are worried too that um, the slaves that have been freed are going to end up coming north and are going to be given uh, the jobs of northern whites okay so this uh, this has a lot of um, economic backlash uh, and political backlash to Lincoln specifically um, and the the issue of freed slaves taking jobs becomes a talking point uh, well into the period of Reconstruction. Okay, this becomes a major argument against emancipation among Northerners in particular, okay, because they're worried that the delicate balance that the North um, has when it comes to this type of thing is going to be upset by a sudden influx of individuals who uh, are suddenly potentially made citizens. Okay, so we'll talk about the rest of that in the second half.